All right, so we're recording um, from a legal point of view. This is just a uh, best efforts basis. Um, if for, for some reason anybody here gets triggered by any of the topics involved, uh, you must take care of yourself. It's your choice. You come out of the webinar, come back into the recording someday, start, stop as you choose. But neither Sherry nor I nor Ann nor anybody else who may appear here can take any responsibility for anybody else. There, I said it. Now, for newcomers, we're gonna bring Sherry on here in a second, but um, Sherry is the director of the Gary Craig Official EFT Training Center in the English language. We have it in other languages as well. Okay. And as such, she also helps me here with these webinars and among other things, she usually starts us off with a, an orientation. And I suspect this is one of those times, Sherry, would I be right? You would be right, Gary. Well, then please. <laughs> Hi, everybody. If you would, just relax, find a comfortable position. Close your eyes. And let's go within. We go within to that quiet place where we connect more fully and deeply with our higher power, who we refer to as the unseen therapist. We join with her in love. It's love that heals. And to do that, we simply recall a loving moment in our own life for about a moment. And now together in love, we all shift our attention to the present moment, to this webinar. As like-minded travelers on this journey of awakening, we find comfort in knowing that we have been brought together in this moment for the greater good, both for ourselves and everyone else. There is nothing more important we need to do, nowhere else we need to be. It is our desire to be more of who we truly are, who we were created to be. Each of us is on a unique path to higher awareness. And we wanna remember that we have eternal access to one who knows the way. Unseen therapist, you know the way. You are our guide and teacher. We want to hone our ability to hear your voice and to distinguish your voice from any other. To do this, we go into that quiet, peaceful place where your voice can be heard. We go there now. And we remain in this silence for a moment or two to feel the strength of your presence within us and to feel it growing ever stronger. And so it is. 
Ah, uh, Sherry, thank you. And yes, and so it is, and so it will be today as we <laughs> join together, all of us, with Anne uh, on a healing journey to benefit, to benefit everyone. A few comments first, however. Um, the feedback that I've gotten. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I still don't have feedback from everybody, but I still we have feedback, so so thank you. Um, but among the feedbacks, there are some uh, who really want, like the way this is unfolding with and this series of raising our belief ceilings. Others um, are, are more inclined to want what they consider to be the centerpiece of that is, and that is our sessions with Anne, like that's the centerpiece. And more specifically, is her breast going to grow back and things like that. Um, I do want to emphasize something here. Um, this goal is not about, or this series is not necessarily about sessions with Anne. It is, it is about raising our belief ceilings so that more and more things become, oh, possible to us. We get limited a lot, a lot, you know, in our, in our beliefs. But that's, that's really where we're going here. Now, we'll be spending a little more time with Anne today than we have in the, in the past. But I, I do want to make that point because it's raising our belief ceilings, which means we will be giving examples and things that aren't necessarily right on point with Anne um, to help expand all of that okay so along those lines i have to remind you that to be the beginning of all this um you know i gave some you know initial instructions and the part of that was for you to do a, do an upgraded list of your specific events and issues and so on give them zero to tens so that as this series goes on those subtle things that may escape your attention that are actually raising your belief ceilings, actually creating some results within you that are so subtle you're not noticing it, yet they're powerful. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping all or most of you have done that because that's one of the major, major values here. Um, and I would urge you as today's webinar and future webinars and so on unfold, that you're taking notes. Oh, what's happening here? Oh, I just remembered, a, oh, that's a belief of mine. Another specific event, uh, that, you know, notes are important in all this because they're designed to trigger all of that. Now, I want to tell you in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, possibilities of raising our belief ceilings. I want to relate to you a story. It's a personal story. It's an inspirational story. It's one that I participated in myself. Uh, I may or may not have tears as I tell it. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Okay. Um, but it has to it's, I, I turn back the clock now. Let's go back to the 1980s. I was attending a um, personal improvement workshop, among other things. And there were several hundred people in this seminar. And among other things, I walked on hot burning coals, you know, something we, our belief systems, uh, you're going to burn yourself. <laughs> you know, you're going to come up with charred feet and so on. It's also something that while well, a lot of people do that, and I did it myself successfully, okay. It also gets explained away by a lot of science, if you will. Among them is, oh, well, when you're doing that, there's this little layer of sweat on the bottom of your feet that keeps your feet cool. Okay. Well, okay. Uh, that is an idea, but I, I don't see where some little layer of sweat is doing that. It's really a belief thing going on. You work a lot with your beliefs about what's possible. You distract your mind as you go up across the coals, you, which means you distract your beliefs about all of that and so on. But walking on fire is not what we're going to aim at here. In this seminar, 
which lasted, I think, about three days. There was a lady by the name of Sally. Now, Sally stood out from everyone else because she had a severely deformed body as a result of, of um, oh, why am I freaking, why am I freaking, well, uh, cerebral palsy. When she, when she would sit in a chair, most people sit in a chair and they're sitting like, like this and they're watching. Sally wasn't sitting like this. She couldn't. She, she was like this. Okay. She was bent. Like this. She couldn't sit up straight. Her, her hands were knotted together like this. She couldn't, she couldn't open them. Right. Her, her face was, was um, distorted. Uh, and she didn't have, she couldn't speak very well. And you had to listen really hard to hear anything she was saying. And, and she, she could not control a lot of things. And some saliva would come out of her mouth and uncontrollably and things like that. Okay. So Sally stood out in that way. Um, I look back at that and I say to myself, you know, I missed a big opportunity there, but see, I just, at that time of my life, I didn't know how to communicate with her. So like everybody else, I let her be. But here was an opportunity because people with cerebral palsy, by the way, it may seem when you look at them, if their bodies are distorted like this, it may seem like their mental capacities are distorted, but not so, not so. There's a real person in there who thinks like everybody else does. It's not, it's not contaminated in that way at all. So I missed that opportunity, but let me carry on with this story. One of the things we did is we broke up into smaller groups and Sally happened to be in my smaller group of maybe 20, 25 people, something like that. And what we were gonna do for the day was learn how, or at least for the few hours we're in this, Subsession: how to break wood with our bare hands, take our hands and crash it through a board. Now, the, the boards were you know, about this size, and they were about three-fourths of an inch thick. It's not the kind of thing you can just break over your knee. No, uh, that was, and they were really solid boards. Somebody would hold a board up, and then we would hit the board with this part of our hand like that and break it. That was the idea. But in order to do that, we had to change our belief systems. Right? It wasn't, we were told, brute force that would break that board. It would be your mental intention. That's beyond our belief systems typically. And the instructions were to Look beyond the board. You didn't have to hit it with great big brute force. Just look beyond the board like that and crash and it, you would crash through it. Well, I wasn't listening. I, the guy with a strong athletic background, was going to do this easily. <laughs> so I didn't pay attention to instructions. <laughs> And there I was in front of this board. And, I hit that thing and it, nothing happened. I mean, nothing happened except I, I got major pain here in this part of my hand. <laughs> well, that didn't work, you know, so I thought I'd try it again. And I, oh, even more pain, you know. But then I started noticing other people were doing it, including women, men who were not as athletic my view is me, we're doing this. So I thought, well, I better pay, I better pay attention. <laughs> Maybe I'll follow instructions. What a, what a concept, all right? <laughs> so I did that. I started, I started looking at that board and then looking beyond it, putting my intention about my hand going be, beyond the board and, and reaching this spot on the other side of the board while somebody was holding it up. And lo and behold, I went right through it. All right. Well, that's a that's a belief changer. You didn't need brute force to do that. Oh, OK. Got it. Got it. Now, 
I'm going to digress just for a moment. There's a popular TV program in America called Survivor, where people get on an island and it's a big social psychological experiment and they vote each other off and somebody ends up winning a million dollars because there's a last one standing. But they're on this deserted island. And at one point, the producers of the show bring on a native of the islands there. And, you know, there the people on the island are supposed to be able to survive and live off the land, if you will, including coconuts that are there. Now, a lot of times we see coconuts in stores and they're like this big, and they got this really hard shell on them that you've got to hit with a sledgehammer or something that to break open. And But what you may not know is even when they're in a tree, they're not, they don't have this, it's not just this little hard shell coconut thing they have a covering on them about this thick it's a big fibrous covering and all of that which if you just got your bare hands and no tools it's really i mean you gotta really dig into this. it is a real chore even to get down to the hard thing that you could then maybe smash against a rock or something like that to break open but they would bring on a they brought on a fellow a native there and he took one of these large encased coconuts put it on a rock and just like when we broke the board. Okay. He just took his hand and went boom like that. And the whole thing just smashed and broke open both the, the covering it's and what's underneath it. Well, that's another, that was easier for me to believe at that time when I watched it on television, just a couple of months ago um, because of the earlier experience of crashing through the board. All right, so that's, that's one thing about our beliefs. We've got to sometimes see these things and experience these things and say, ah, oh, oh, there's more to me and what we can do than I'm believing. But now we come to Sally. Sally has no brute force whatsoever. In fact, when it came Sally's turn, she was one of the last to do this. The board would be up and Sally would go, because <clears throat> that's all she could do with her body. It's, and, and, and nothing happened. Nothing. Nothing. But Sally, having seen everybody else do this and knowing she had a compromised body, just became determined she was going to be like everyone else. This adds to your beliefs, by the way, when you have motivation. She was determined she could do this. So <clears throat> nothing. Three or four of these <clears throat> and nothing. Okay. But by this time, everybody else was watching her. And rather than sitting there thinking, I'm going to be judged, which, by the way, Anne, is one of the things you, <laughs> you have dealt with and everybody else de deals with here at one level or another, there was this fire in her eyes she was just simply going to do this and it didn't matter how long it took it was she was somehow going to do this and so she tried a couple more times nothing and then the audience the remaining 20 or so of us there began developing the idea that she really could but she needed some help and we would, do, we would start yelling, Sally, 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 this kind of thing, okay? She knew everybody was there. It'll take me a minute, hold on. So I don't know how she did this, but I'm watching her and her body suddenly comes alive in a way that we hadn't seen before. And she shifts her body back in a way we hadn't seen before. And there was somehow or other a fluidity came into her body. It was seemingly impossible. And she rings back and boom, like that. Still didn't hit it as hard as someone else might. But for her, much harder. And 
her hand went right through that. <laughs> it went right through that board and just splintered. Of course, we all cheered. And Sally was just ecstatic. I mean, ecstatic. It's a moment you never forget, but it's a moment where you have a belief, an impossibility that this could happen. And there it was. Bah. We have capabilities way beyond what our thinking is. And this is just merely a, an example of that. Now, my guess is other people listening in have seen or experienced something like that, watched it somewhere. You've seen it and kind of go, wow. But then you somehow or other, it's human nature. We tend to, tend to oh, dismiss it. Oh, wasn't that fantastic? But we don't say to ourselves, or tend not to say ourselves, ourselves at least permanently. Oh, if that can happen, I can do this. And you know, no, no, okay, it's a contributor to raising our belief system, but it tends to be transitory. At least that's my experience. Sally, later on in this seminar, the guy who was running it brought her up there. And everybody knew who Sally was, even though they weren't all in her board-breaking group. And they knew that her hands were locked like this. Okay. She stands up and, and, and now she's talking. Not really clearly, but you could hear what she's saying. And she was saying something like, you guys think there's no one in here and I got it. And then she starts talking about beliefs you had to listen hard, but it was much better than it was. Okay? And it was clear what she was saying. And she takes one of her knotted up hands like this. And it goes like this. All right. Impossible before. I don't know if she's here or not today. If she is, if Cassandra is here. Uh, you might raise your hand, Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra is someone, one of our members, who also has cerebral palsy, not to that degree, but has it and had, because I was talking, this was years ago when she first joined, her hand also was like this. And currently she can do this with it quite easily over time, having done all this, okay. Impossible, impossible. Well, if you believe it is, it's impossible. <laughs> but. I give you that as an example of raising our belief ceilings. All right. Okay. With that in mind. And your hand is raised. Let's you and I talk a little bit, can we? Hold on a second. Are you there? Okay. Can you hear me? Wonderfully. Wonderfully. Okay. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, what I thought we would do, you and I discussed this a little bit the other day, but just so everybody else knows, um, you know, we've had sessions in between our last webinar and now and so on, and things have occurred within it. I wanted to go over some of those things so that it brings everybody up to date a little bit, check out where you are on them. And then as this, as our conversation unfolds, I'm expecting to, I'm, I'm, if something occurs where I go, oh, why don't we do an unseen therapist session now on whatever's coming up? And we will have sessions like that, but they will be customized to whatever shows up here today. We did discuss that, did we not? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. All right. Good. Whatever happens. All right. <laughs> whatever happens, okay. All right. Now. In our last newsletter, I, I published an article, you know, that you had, 
written very well. And just to bring people up to speed here, we have started all this with a metaphor of the palace of possibilities. And each of us has our own little room in the palace of possibilities. And there's writing on our walls, which re represents our beliefs, our shoulds, our shouldn'ts, our cans, our can'ts, our musts, our must nots, our rights, our wrongs, our traumas, all that stuff is there. Okay. And we stay in our own little room in this grand palace of possibilities where everything is possible, but we stay in our own little limited room. And we did some work with that metaphor the first time. But since, I need you to have you remind me how we came about this. And you developed in your own imagination the um, a basement to your room in the Palace of Possible. Give me your recollection of how that how that happened and what happened in the basement. Just okay. Um, yes, you you had. Uh, so here's my voice a little tight because I'm nervous. So you had worked with someone else with the idea of a basement. But when you suggested basement to me, I, I, I think I had a different concept. I saw you had actually suggested to me to go into the basement. I thought I was looking for answers to my skeletons or whatever. So I was excited about the idea. Because years ago, um, I had picked up a book called Creative Visualization, and it was suggested you do an exercise. You go, you create a secret place and a guide, and you would go to this place to get answers. So I had done that previously. My secret place was a cavern. Uh, underground, and the guy that showed up was a little Chinese Chinaman with sort of a wizard hat and a long beard, and he told me his name was Ching, and that he would be my guide. So I'd go into the cavern and ask questions or, or want a problem resolved. He would take me through the cavern, and, and, and I would get stories and answers to my problems. So the basement was exciting. And, and, and Ching, by the way, is equivalent to our unseen therapist. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Continue, please. Yes. Okay. So Ching was the wisdom that comes from the unseen therapist. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I went into the basement, when I was thinking of going into the basement, Ching showed up at the door. So he opens the door for me. And my first question was, what is the programming of beliefs that I need to work with? Because there are so many beliefs that I was taught and stuff, and I didn't even know how to focus or where to go or what to work with. So um, also, you had told me in your experience that it's very difficult for Catholics to try to break down those beliefs and get beyond them. So I, I needed to know what they were. Well, just, um, there are many Catholics yes. who, who uh, really enjoy the Catholic church. All the teachings, they get a great deal out of it and so on. So we're really not, we're really not, you know, talking, you know, anything bad about the Catholic Church. You, however, have a very different set of views. I'm just, I'm doing this for the audience, okay? And a very different set of views. Uh, you ended up, because of your mother's insistence and encouragement and all of that, to become a nun, but you ended up resisting those teachings. And they were imposed upon you, your view. Um, didn't like them, and, and on and on and on it went. So, here comes a lot of resistance, a lot of things you don't want to do. And this is the centerpiece of many of the issues we're talking about. Okay, I just want to say that. Okay. okay, yes, you're right. This is about me and my issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first thing that I saw in the basement was an old trunk. Inside the trunk was a black book. Inside the book were the belief 
where it was a list of beliefs. And it was three main beliefs. And it was fear of God, fear of my body, and fear of punishment. Okay, and each one had a little description, fear of God. God is this judge in the sky, and he's going to punish bad girls, and he's going to let the good ones go to heaven. And But it was very hard to get in heaven because there's more sins than there are is perfection. So also fear of God was fear of the church because it, the church represented God, and so I had to keep the rules of the church also. And then fear of my body. That was because I'm a sinner. Uh, even in the church, they are the prayers of the mass say, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. God have mercy on me. So I never really understood why they would teach us that Jesus redeemed our sin, redeemed us when he died on the cross, because Still, we're born sinners, still we're sinners, and we aren't being redeemed, and we've still got to get redeemed. So that was a little confusing. But in this fear of body was also fear of sex, the no masturbating, no premarital sex, no birth control pills, um, no pleasure, have babies, all that. So all of that was included in fear of my body. And then fear of punishment, I was so scared of breaking rules, of being, getting in trouble, I was going to hell. Uh, so that included a lot of things like uh, not breaking rules, keeping rules, trying to do everything I could to be perfect so I wouldn't go to hell. And of course, the no punishment goes back to fear of God and fear of the body. I was going to be punished for both of those things. <laughs> okay, so I had something to work with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> something. <Lots>. something. <laughs> yes, some focus. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so the next scene, I wanted to know how did I get programmed with these beliefs? I see this, uh, there's another part, Ching takes me to another part of the basement. There's this little girl kneeling down in front of her mother with her hands folded and she's saying her prayers perfectly. And she is like between two and three years old because my mother always told me I learned my prayers at two, perfectly. So my mother's sitting there, I'm saying my prayers and she's so happy, but she, you know, because here I am, saying the prayer. So this gives her the opportunity to tell me about God, heaven, hell, punishment, devil, all that stuff. It's because here's this little girl so anxious to learn and to, to take on these ideas because I could see I was pleasing her. There was no affection. There was no hugging. There was no saying, I'm proud of you, but I could feel my mother's pleasure. And then, so it was like she was wrapping this little warm cloak around me, tying it at the neck of her beliefs. So I was willingly taking these on. All right, let me stop there a second, because this cloak becomes important in your story. So it's, you're wearing this cloak around you. It is covering you. It is beliefs. It is your connection to your mother, your connection to God, your connection to truth, your connection to all of these things that was so essential to you. And even if they happen to be wrong or you happen to eventually not believe them, you're still wearing them. Am I saying that right? Yes. In the, for in the yes. form of the cloak. Now, there yes. are other cloaks. Your grandmother gives you cloaks. Okay. Yes. She showed uh, up next. Okay. Yes. The church gives you cloaks. Do I, am I saying it right? Yes. Yes, All that's right. right. And in a way, your father, although it not being religiously oriented, was giving you cloaks, you know, about limits in your world and, and so on. And so you have all these cloaks. Yes? Yes. That's all right. Correct. Please, please go on. Okay. So my, my grandmother did show up and she was putting cloaks around me and, and they, they kept putting more cloaks and I warmly welcomed them. <laughs> 
I wanted to please them. I wanted, it was like getting love from them. So, um, so the next, in the next scene, the next time I saw Ching, I said, okay, I've got to change this. I've got to tell them that God is love. So in the next scene, I saw myself as this little girl kneeling down. And I said to my mom, no, God is love. God is love. And I turned to my grandma and I said, there's no judgment. There's no hell. And I stand up and I say, there's no judgment, no hell. There's, it's all good. God is love. And so then this, I suddenly became a fire in the middle of these three people. A, a fire. A fire. F-I-R-E. Yeah, yes. Okay. All right. It was like I was a little campfire in the middle of these three people and my flames went all the way up to the ceiling. And I understood they were just standing around me. They weren't burning. I wasn't burning. But I realized that my, the cloaks were burning off of me. The beliefs. The, the beliefs, the cloaks were. Yes. All right. The beliefs now, were starting. All right. Now let me, let, I, got, I, I just need to add a little something in here. I'm not sure if you and I talked about this directly, but let me let me bring it up. All along surrounding all of this is your work with our audience here from past webinars, your own work with yourself, with unseen therapists, and so on. My view, loosening up the hold that these former beliefs had on you. And I may be wrong on this, but it would seem to me they contribute, that previous work contributed to, oh, the cloaks need to go. Here comes the fire. Now, tell me if you think that's true, false. I think that's definitely true. And thank you so much, everyone, because I know everyone contributed to my understanding and my insights to those things, yes. Well, yeah, but I want to now emphasize those are belief changes. Those cloaks are heavy beliefs, and they are burning. If that's not a belief, it's a metaphor, of course. But that's a belief change. That's a belief shift, a big one, a big one. My, my view, go ahead, please. Yes, and it's still burning because when I think of the basement, there's still that fire, but the people are gone. Uh, first, the parents, my parents and grandmother and grandfather, they turned in the mannequins. But next time I saw them, there was no essence in them. But the, the next last, time, the next time you saw them in the basement, yeah, in the basement, yeah, right. and then, and then now they're gone. So it makes me feel that a lot of the beliefs have started or gone, but there's still more because I'm still in the fire. Yes. Okay, sure, sure, okay. Okay, and then the next thing that happened was that the unseen therapist pulled me out of that fire that one day, and I, I sent you the thing that you published in your newsletter, the yeah. story of seeing my mother in that whole bedroom scene, yes. Yeah, okay. Now, we don't know really what's underneath all of that, but I want to shift for the moment, if I, and thank you for that, Emma. I want to shift for the moment to something you and I did just a day or two ago. Okay. You had written me a number of things, but one of the things that you wrote to me, and we explored a bunch of stuff, and we tend to land on this one, had to do with, as you were growing up and were very young, you were required to learn the piano and you hated it. Yes. Your mother true. wanted you to learn the piano. Uh, Sister Mary Magdalene, who you have created another nun at the, at the time, who you have, who you described as a rather cold woman, okay, was insisting that you do your piano lessons and you resist it and hated it and hated it and hated it. Do I, do I have an amen? <laughs> yes. Amen. <laughs> now, I'm fast forwarding here a little because I want to get to something. To, to me, was fascinating. Okay. You also said in one of your letters to me that while you hated the piano lessons, there was another part of your letter 
where you saw yourself as uh, being out of the basement. I think you were out of the basement. You were somewhere in the palace. of possibility, I, I was in the basement, but I was out of the fire again. OK, a little kid out of the okay. fire. But playing the piano in a joyous way, a being free way. You said right, my little the piano's keys were small, so my little fingers would would, uh, you know, play the piano and it was joyous and I was doing cartwheels and it was a very free da -da 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 playing the piano. Okay. Now, I saw that. I think I should say the unseen therapist urged me to see, put some things together. That here was a metaphor we could use. Um, where you see, you hate the piano. So you hate things being imposed upon you. Um, Sister Mary Magdalene would impose this on you. Your mother would impose this on you. And all there's all these specific events around that. That I saw this hatred of the piano pointing to that we could address. But then I'm also seeing the freedom of actually playing the piano with joy and all of that. So you and I had a session about that where we imagined you playing this piano and you were having, as I recall it, you were having a great deal of fun with that. It was a very free thing for you that, and I was hearing in that belief change, belief change, belief change differently. Belief shift, belief shift, belief shift. Doesn't mean they all change automatically, perfectly, da -da. but moving in freedom's direction rather than I'm being imposed upon. And I hate all this kind of thing. Did I say it right? Would you say it otherwise? Yes, no, that's true. I was having a great time. And then it right. was interesting that the piano showed up because I hated performing, I hated practicing. I. It was an imposition on me feeling forced. Okay. Talk about, if you would, what went on during our session. And I've got some thoughts about maybe you and I doing some expansion on that session, but we, we'll see. Okay. Uh, now, but, but talk about what happened in there. How did you feel? What was going on? Just talk about that for a bit, if you could, as, as, as well as you remember it. Okay, so we tried to re, redevelop, re-see that scene again and go back into that scene. And so um, with your prompting somewhat, and again, I was dancing around the basement and I was turning cartwheels, jumping up and down. And then I sat on the piano with Ching and Ching, we were playing a duet. We were playing madly away. It was like ragtime music joyful sometimes jump up on the piano and the and the unseen therapist was leaning her arm against the piano and listening to us and watching and smiling and uh we were just having a great time was there something else that came through well, there? Well, that's that's yeah whatever you whatever you remember about that now talk a little bit about and I haven't really asked you this. I think I asked you about it some, but just whatever you remember. What impact that metaphor, that imagination had on your belief systems about impositions, Mary Magdalene, the beliefs of others that were imposed upon you, whether or not you should keep them, the burning cloaks, I mean, that kind of thing. Yes, you were trying to help me find a metaphor for experiencing freedom, to feel free. And we talked about a couple people that I thought had some qualities of freedom, but it came back to that scene as a little girl, four to six years old in that basement was the most freedom I could experience. Even freedom from the physical things that are wrong with me now, because I was young and alive and uh, happy and free. There were no parents down there. There was nobody telling me what to do. It was a great sense of freedom. 
All right, and if you've got a nice smile on your face, etc. It is my view, and I just, I'm speaking to the whole audience now, that as we find these freedom things in our world, in your case, playing the piano freely, that we spend more time in that freedom zone because the more time we spend there and not dwelling on the lack of freedom, the more time we're going to gravitate towards it. That's just, you know, common, common sense in a way. Now, I'm, rec- I, I'm going to shift just for, I'm going to get back to that in a moment, but I'm going to shift for a moment. There was an email that came in to me from one of our members and she had some suggestions for you about documenting, you know, what was going on and so on and might be helpful down the road and all of that. And I, I sent that to you for your perusal. And you responded to that in a way that surprised me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you responded to that because you weren't really buying Precisely what she was saying. But instead of, as you might normally have done, going, see, how can I please her? How can I word this in a way where I do whatever she wants me to do and this kind of stuff? Rather, you very politely uh, and nicely basically said, no, I'm going to do it my way. Formerly, you would have called that a confrontation, I think. But here, even though you were in a mild way objecting and not want to go along with what was suggested, you had both feet firmly planted and here's where I stand. And I pointed that out to you. And I think that surprised even you, but talk about that. (laughs) Yes, it did. Yes. You, you pointed out right away that I kind of just, stood for what I was going to stand for. And I didn't argue with myself or anybody else. I just put out there what I wanted to do. Okay. Now that is a, that's evidence of a substantial belief change, but it happens subtly. You didn't even notice it. Yes. No, I didn't notice it, but I will say this when you pointed it out, After I got off the phone with you, I started thinking, well, what did he want? What was I supposed to do? And then I go, no, I did what I wanted to do. I said what I wanted to say. Without having, what at the time, without having to sit there and massage everything, I got to say it just right so I don't hurt somebody's feelings and all of that. That's the way I'm saying it anyway. This is true. But I do appreciate the woman who, suggested the things yeah. and I thought it was really something I would have never thought of. Yeah. And it, it was very well meant and all of that. Um, but you stood your ground. That's the point. And that is a, at least the way I'm seeing all of this from my discussions with you, that's a really big move, but subtle and you didn't even notice it. Yes. Yes. It was great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, we also spent a little time, I think it was yesterday or day before, aiming at the symptoms of your voice, for example. And and there's two lumps on your right where the breast was removed on on the right side. I'm going to back up here. Getting to the lumps for the moment. When you and I first started having conversations several weeks ago, um, one of your big concerns, it was, it was like forever there, was there was occasionally some kind of tingling or some kind of sensation in these two lumps that made you worry that oh oh, cancer is coming back and and it was a a pretty much ongoing concern do i I remember that right yes it was it was actually the reason that i joined the program in the early december 
Yes. Right. Now, in our more recent conversations, you've said to me things like, well, I, I'm, I, I'm just not that concerned about it anymore. Um, that may not be your words. What, what are your words now? Yes, especially when I was doing these basement experiments, um, I wasn't thinking about my body. I wasn't concerned what was going on there. It was like it was secondary to, to the emotional work I was doing in these stories that were being uncovered. Yes. So it kind of had, it took a second place. I wasn't even thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. And in the meantime, how have the sensations in your right breast area? Uh, I, are they still, I still there? Have, less, yeah. Or? Sometimes I still have them. a little tingling and pinching sometimes, not very much, sometimes at nighttime. Yes. Well, the frequency compared to what it was several weeks ago, would it be half the frequency or half the intensity or a third or, or 80% or 20%? What? Give me well, some estimate. I drink carrot juice because it helps kill cancer and it keeps it very mild. If I go a week or two without doing carrot juice, it tingles a lot more. So it, I, it's been probably about the same through the whole thing. But um, a few times when I have worked on different issues, I could feel kind of like throbbing in them, but it would go away it, and it doesn't stay long and doesn't happen often. So I can't really at this point say it's a lot less than it was. It's kind of hard to judge. All right, but you're focusing on it less. Yes, definitely. A lot less. I don't even think about it sometimes for days. Oh. Even if it tingles a little, I just don't even just pass it off. Yeah. Okay. It's a big change. Yes. All right. Now, getting to your voice for the moment. Your voice right now, at least to my ears, is about 50 or 60% improved over it was when we first started talking some weeks ago. Yes, now yes, I think so. Does that how, is that how it feels at the moment? Yes, it, it does sound better. Hopefully okay. a little better than the beginning of this today, I think. It feels easier for me at this point. Yeah. But yes, it would be interesting to go back and see that first recording as to now. Yes. Well, you've got it. So yes, go back and look at it. But anyway, um, uh, let me look back here on my notes. Oh, oh, okay. Um, as we have had discussions, and I, I'm going to do a little session with you here with you here in a moment. I got something's coming up here, but getting back to your voice here for a second. In our previous discussions, I have noted there were times when I, I said to you, your voice now is 100% okay. You were up, you know, you got onto something and you were talking and, and there was no impediment in your voice at all. And you recognize that. Just the other day, I was saying it was like 90% improved and you were recognizing that. So it gets really improved sometimes and it falls back and gets really improved and then falls back and this, this kind of thing. Uh, I'm saying that well, am I? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. It keeps raising my belief that it can be a hundred percent someday. And that's the whole point because you've gotten there already. Okay. Yes. I've gotten closer. Yeah. You've broken the board, so to speak. Yes. Is that a good metaphor? <laughs> I, uh... I haven't quite broken the board, maybe. I'm getting there. <laughs> okay. Like Sally, um, one more sock. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right, now, let me tell you what I have in mind. You tell me if this fits for you, that we do an unseen therapist session. Okay. And I bring back the piano, P the joyous playing of the piano. Now, other things may occur once I get started, but, I, but this sort of floated into me from Unseen Therapist. That we do this, and as those 
joyous notes come floating out of you perfectly the piano and all kinds of joy and ching involved and all of that um that the notes the notes come out of the piano and the loving joyous notes float around your throat and voice area float around your breast area and so on all the time hopefully aiming at two things one is whatever emotional issues still need to be addressed to help unlock further healing in those areas as well as just flat out aiming at the symptom okay now does that fit does that say do you guys no 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 not not quite and you'd add something to it or tell me with that little intro i think i think at this point that would be a good and the next stage to work with yes all right well then why don't we do that so we want to do this in a way where where our entire audience can benefit and can assist so let me just give the audience some instructions if we may um i know i know it's tempting to want to put your own issues in here but we really want to emphasize the point that when you're working with somebody else, we're all one. If you're working on behalf of somebody else, we're all one. And while you may not see a benefit directly for you at the moment, it's likely to be happening behind the scenes. It's, if we, you recall, we all have the same issues. Only the details are different. So you may or may not have voice issues in and um, you know breast issues and, and this kind of thing, but you do have you know other imposed limits on you emotionally and otherwise, as we all do. So the idea here is for everybody just to join in, be an, or if you can, as we discussed before. Be the unseen therapist, because you are anyway. And that's a little reach for some people, okay? But however you want to do it, join in Anne's behalf. So we get the power of love being shared. Later on, if you want to come back to this recording and plug in your own stuff to it, um, well, go ahead. Go ahead. But for now, for now, leave your stuff out of it. You might want to identify it before we start, but while we're doing it, we're here for Anne. And that means we're here for ourselves as well, but it's just not as easy to see. So are you ready, Anne? Yes. Yes, I'm ready. All right. Thank so you. You've been here before. So if you would, and everybody else, take a nice, deep, relaxing breath. And just recall your loving moment. And, and I can see you just nod your head whenever you're there. Okay, good. Good. All right. So let's shift our focus now. Let's go to this basement underneath our, our room in the Palace of Possibilities, remembering that our room has all these writings on our walls that limit us, the shoulds and shoulds and cans and cans and all of that. And the Palace of Possibilities itself is just outside that room, outside that basement where everything is possible. Everything is joyous. But we're going to start as a little you. There's the piano. In fact, you even have a Keyboard is still at home. Do you not, Ann? Yes, I do. Okay. But they, well, let's just bring your keyboard in for the moment. There's your keyboard. There's the keys ready for you to play. You may at first have this thought, oh, uh oh, people are going to be listening to me. I'm on stage here. And Ching is there. She kind of giggles. He says, well, you've been here before. Okay. <laughs> We're going to have a little fun. So 
let them join. The more fun we have, the more fun they will have. You know? So let them be their own thing. Okay. Now, I want to digress here just for a moment because I can see a few videos here and I'm noticing a couple of people are yawning already. Now, let me just point something out to you. Okay. One of the things that happens, and I can't be sure it's happening for you right now at this moment, but it happens often enough to bring it up. But as we start getting into a way of climbing our stairway to miracles, a way of letting go of our worldly beliefs and getting more into the spiritual place, which is our true reality, our egos don't want us to go there. <laughs> And some people during this even fall asleep. It's not bad. It's just to be observed. You can always come back to this. But I just point that out. If you yawn, you get heavy eyes. If you, you want to fall asleep, go ahead and fall asleep. It's okay. It's all right. But anyway, so there we are. And there you are, Anne. Down there in this place. And even... Even those of our members who don't even know how to play the piano and, and have no background in music at all, they can imagine themselves sitting there as, a, as the young you starting to play this piano. And even though they have no lessons whatsoever, they can start playing this like a virtuoso. Just like you can. Ragtime or whatever you want. Okay. Ching is there. He becomes a little smaller than the structure of man you envision and is sitting right near by the, the keeper. In fact, he's, on, he's much smaller now. He's uh, three or four inches tall. And he's just dancing and laughing and smiling and you're, you're, you're playing with him and he jumps on your shoulder and he's da 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 And as you're playing, as you're playing, you can visually see the notes, the notes come out of the piano and they float around and they have little ching faces on them and they're happy <laughs> and they're dancing by themselves as the notes come out. They have no limits. Can you do this, Anne? Yes, I can see that. All right, great. All right. So there they are, dancing around, dancing around. And there are some other notes that are coming out of the piano as well. There are notes reflecting um, the statements, the beliefs, well meant perhaps by Sister Mary Magdalene, your mother, your grandmother, and others. And they're coming out as well, but these, these notes are the discordant ones. These are the ones that are off key. These are the ones that are kind of take away from the melody. And as they come out, they just sort of, we acknowledge them, but they just sort of float gently to the ground. While the other joyous notes, the freedom notes, are dancing all over, and they all have little ching faces on them and, and everything else. And they see the uh, throat there, your throat area, and your vocal cords. And it sees restrictions there. It sees some of the discordant notes that are still somehow lodged in there and haven't fallen to the ground. And so you're in your imagination, ah, here they come. And they start dancing within your throat. They say, oh, look at this emotion here. Look at this emotion. Let's just go dance around it and dance around it and dance around it. So it has no choice but to go, what am I doing here? <laughs> and the discordant note, the imposition, the emotional cause, 
behind all of this, the resentment, the resistance, and so on behind the voice. It's danced around and round and around with a little ching, ching smiley face notes and begins to fade. And tell me, and are you, number one, are you able to do this? And number two, what's happening with the, those discordant notes? Uh, I can see the notes falling to the ground. I can see the notes flying through the air with Ching in the middle of them. It's, it's fun. It's, it's fan fantasy. It's, it's uplifting. And I can, I could feel them going around my throat, and 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 there was just there was some relaxation there. I think when I speak, I I still feel some of that discordant part. But there's a sense of kind of a, a calmness coming. All right. Well, let's just spend, everybody spend in, in Anne's behalf, a few moments with that discordant feeling. Allow it to fade. We'll just give a few moments for that. Just do that. All right, and then the piano is continuing to be played. The notes are coming out, the little Ching's little faces on them. And now they shift to your right breast area where the two lumps are. And they notice the lumps, and they notice that the lumps are, are representative, representative of more discordant notes emotional notes, deeper things that have not been resolved yet. And while those deeper things may or may not be completely dislodged today with this particular thing, this particular exercise, both in the breast and the voice, they can be loosened. See, we are raising our belief ceilings, raising them, raising them. That's the point. We're going from, oh, that can't be, to, oh, maybe so. Okay. Or, yeah, yeah, big possibility, or wherever it is on that, on that scale. But there they are. Da -da 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 -da, all this music going on. And now the music, instead of being ragtime, changes into this beautiful love ballad. It's a love song. And there are gentle notes that float around the right breast area and the two lumps. And they allow the lumps to yawn. Let them fall asleep. They don't really need to be there. It's a love song. Are you able to do this, Anne? Yes. It's very peaceful. All right. And spend whatever time you want with that love song. Ching's help, unseen therapist's help, the audience's help as it floats around the two lumps, the right, right breast area. Take whatever time you want until you've gone as far as you think you can go and then just, just say something to me and we'll proceed from there.
also, this reminds me that that little child cannot have cancer. It, that little child cannot be diseased in any way. And because when, because she's free and when I am able to be free, I can't have it either. Totally free. Yeah. That's what it says to me. All right. You may not be there yet, okay? but we are raising our belief ceilings about what's possible. I just imposed that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right, we're going to have a little time left here, I think, Anne. So if anybody has questions or comments or anything like that and you'd like to raise your hand, now would be a good time to do so. In the meantime, in the meantime, Anne, tell me, tell me where you are with that exercise. Did new things come up? Not? More of the same? What was? Give me some feedback. I, th I don't think there was a lot new at this point. Um, but it was, it was very peaceful. I really took in all this beautiful love and thoughts that people were sending me. I could just, it just kind of, it actually, I could just feel this whole energy in my throat and chest area just kind of soften. And so I could feel all that. And so as, as the days go on and I will bring that energy in. And so thank you, everybody. I just want to say thank you. All right. Now, and, and you're on stage. You know, are you still nervous, by the way? Not as much, but my voice shows it. So I think I am. <laughs> okay. All right. So I want to ask you a question, but I want you to, to um, think a moment on it before you respond. Sort of a testing question. This webinar today, the one before and the one before that, has you as you as the centerpiece. Okay. Do you deserve it? Well, that's interesting because this morning I was writing about deserving because I I've had this idea. When I thought some weeks ago about the ovarian cancer I had and the breast cancer at the same time, that this idea came to me, I deserve to be punished. And so this morning, I was kind of thinking about all that. And then I, so I would write, I deserve to be punished. I deserve to go to hell, all that stuff. And then I started writing, no, I deserve to be happy. I deserve to be free. I deserve to be on this program. I do deserve. And it, it was like, wow, I went from down in the basement up to the top. It was, it was a great feeling. All so right. it's interesting you bring up the word deserve because I was working with it this morning. Yes. Well, I was just, I wasn't thinking of doing it. I was just sort of, it just pops up like umpteen therapist stuff does once in a while. Okay. It just pops up deserve, ask her about deserve kind of thing. And um, Gabriel Rutan wants to make a comment or ask a question, so ask to unmute. Gabriel. Hi, Gary. Hi, everybody. Hi, hi, my dear. Haven't talked to you for a while. True. Well, you got some thoughts or questions, or where are we? Uh, yes, I was just. You know, uh, Anne was talking about the sensations she has, like the tintling and itchy kind of sensations in her breast. Uh -huh. And I heard you guys discuss that she then is afraid that the cancer is coming back. Yes. I would like to uh, point out that that is another limiting belief that I would very much like to get rid of, if I may. Well, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> For those who don't know who you are, you are, you are a director of the... Gary Craig official EFT training center in the Dutch language. All right. And an, and, and an MD by background. So you've got, you've got all the medical stuff understanding behind you. And so 
So lay lay it on us. Belief stuff, please. Okay. Yes, yes. Well, you know, regarding our bodies and diseases and diagnosis and all that, that is so massively, you know, intertwined with all the, uh, the beliefs we ha we have personally, but also that we uh, unfortunately get from doctors and others that try to explain to us what is, uh, you know, what, what is the matter with our bodies. Um, so I would just like to, could, I could on go on forever, let's not do that, but I would just like to point out that, you know, itchy kind of feelings um, that might be from the skin, but it could, could also be from a little deeper. Um, that is never, ever a sign that there is a cancer, quote unquote, going on. In actual fact, as soon as it itches, most pains, all itches, are clear signs that there's a healing phase going on in your body. A healing phase. Healing phase, yeah, indeed. Okay. Indeed. So um, a little bit depending on what type of uh, cancer you have, cancer is either active in, in the conflict active phase or it shows up in the healing phase. Now, that is too much to discuss, you know, in a, in a, few, a few minutes here. But I just want to point out that... Pain and itching is always tied in to your body healing something. If nerves grow back, that might itch a little. If skin grows back, and you, we all know this, when your skin, you know, recovers from something, it, you know, you get scabs and it itches and all that. Same goes for the breasts. So I just want to take away that that. Um, limiting belief that there is a problem when that area would itch or sting or whatever else. On the contrary, on the contrary. So I could um, probably tell a little more about that, but maybe we might want to do that at another time because this is what I really, you know, really enjoy doing. And I just want to point out that Sherry's bootcamp is has just started, and as tradition. Uh, shows us my boot camp is after uh, Sherry's boot camp and it's on chronic, uh, chronic physical uh, issues. It's all about debunking beliefs because yeah. we have so many beliefs about our bodies and diseases and symptoms and all that. So, Well, let's talk about that for a minute because the yeah. standard belief the lay people in this world have is that if my body hurts someplace, that doesn't mean I'm healing. That means I've got a problem. Okay. My shoulder hurts. My stomach hurts. My, uh, da, 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 da. now, is that always the case? Um, I mean, like, like I can recall at a much younger age, uh, before I had my spiritual experience and mellowed out a little bit, <laughs> I was having stomach pro ulcer type problems, if you will, because I was so hard driven and all that kind of stuff, you know, achieve the American dream and do all that. Okay. Um, and so I was believing that my abdominal issues, my stomach tightness or whatever you want, ulcer type stuff, my layman's term was telling me, uh oh, you know, you got you got yourself a you're getting a problem. You better you better lighten up. That pain is telling you something's wrong with your body. That was my belief. True belief? Not true? Well, very true, because you picked out the, the one very clear example of when pain is associated while you're still in active stress. So uh, also type of problems and, and, and stomach ache. Uh, points out to I can't stomach it you're very stressed about stuff that you really do not like and so that is a very good example thank you Gary of a pain that actually shows you you are still in active stress and so most pains occur when you have already resolved stress or resolved certain types of conflicts that's very confusing for most people because you, you start noticing your problems when it starts hurting. And then you think, I have a problem. And that's what the doctor says and everybody else. However, if you really, really look very closely at what the body is doing, it is 
reprogramming itself and healing itself. And that usually goes with a little fever, a little infection, a little inflammation without germs. Um, but so the, the exception being uh, if your, your stomach hurts, that, that would indicate active stress. Okay. Now, Anne, let me, let me ask you, is it comforting to you to have an MD tell you that the sensations in the lumps are signs that things are getting better? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. <laughs> because I have thought of that sometimes, especially if it's itching. But, but I like to change my beliefs about that. Thank you. Yeah, so wherever there is a little lump or they doctors call it tumors, but wherever tissue grows, um, that is to, uh, it's part of a program, so to speak. Um, and if the growth isn't needed anymore, the extra tissue isn't needed anymore, your body will break it down. This is why we have germs. So germ theory is not, there's all these, you know, very scary little thingies out there and they make us ill, ill. The real germ, uh, germ theory means that we, we cannot exist without our, our little you know, package of germs that we have in us. About three pounds of germs we have in ourselves and on our skin. We need them. Our body needs them to really, you know, really clean house. And if there's little growth of, you know, tumor growth, tissue growth, Germs will break it down for you. And that's where the itching, itching and the inflammation comes from. Very Thank different you. view. I would need, I would need, um, I, I take six lessons in my bootcamp to explain this a little, a little more, you know, in more detail. But, you know, just remember that when your body is, is showing, you know, really clear symptoms, it usually is a healing, a healing phase. All right. Talk about talk about uh, the voice. Yes. So I, I missed. Um, Anne, did, did you have a, a diagnosis for the voice? No, I have not had a diagnosis. Right. Has you have you always had the, the, the coarse voice or when did it no. start? Uh, I've had sore throats and laryngitis since I was a child and they took my tonsils out when I was 18. But they could only take one because I hemorrhaged, so I had to have the other one separately. And I would lose my voice often. I was a teacher, so I would have to learn how to discipline without a voice. And then the raspiness got later. I think I, over time, I became more and more self-conscious of my voice. Yes. And then that would make it worse. Yeah. So um, these types of, this type of symptom... Uh, is tied in with um, startled fear conflict, which means you, somebody, you know, you wanted to say something and then you got really, you know, somebody shot, something shocked you. So literally the, 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 the words got stuck in your throat type of conflict. The other one would, would be um, being allowed to speak out, to, to say what you want to say. Yes, that's true of many times for me. Well, yeah. what's true is the latter part of it. You, 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 you stifled yourself in a way constantly. Yes, yes right? but also uh, there were a lot of times when I would speak and then somebody would say, that's wrong. Don't say that. My mother said it all the time. That's silly. Don't say that. Oh, so that is exactly what I'm trying to find out because that would, that would really show up the way it does now with the hoarse and, and, and scratchy voice because there's probably a little, you know, little thingies on the vocal cords. That's in, a, in and of itself is absolutely completely reversible. But that means, and you also are showing active stress in a way because you're, you know, you're a little nervous uh, on the show. And uh, so it's a conflict that is still ongoing. Yes. So you would yes, also right. need to work on, you know, the stress you have knowing that you're, you know, on air and everybody's looking at you. And uh, the fact that your voice is raspy in itself is activating the conflict because now your, your voice sounds 
silly or a little, you know, weird or not the way you want it to sound. And that keeps this conflict going because now you're speaking. So you're fine. You're speaking now, but now it doesn't sound very nice. So that is, you know, stress and in and of itself. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Right. Very yeah. self-conscious. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so while you're, you're now speaking and you're, you know, we all want to hear you, so we're happy that you're speaking. But now there's a little, you know, your little ego says, well, it's too bad, it's too, you know, your voice doesn't sound good. It's too bad. So now, now you have that stress going on. Yes. And I, I do see this as an opportunity to be able to speak out really for the first time to a public audience and tell my secrets, which I think is helping me on one level. Yes. But yes. Yes. And, and just, you know, ask unseen therapist and, and meditate with her to resolve all these moments where your mother said, I don't say that. That is silly. That is that. that that's not right. All the little, you know, like, like little children will, you know, you startle. You go like, oh, was that wrong? And that really shows up like uh, it, it, the way it does with you. Um, yeah, we've done we've we've done some work on those types of specific events, but there's so much going on. We we do we need to do more of that. I think. Okay. Does, yes. Does that seem right to you, Anne? Like we haven't done enough of them. Yes, it it needs more work. Yes. Yeah. For sure. May right. I, thank you. Sorry, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. May I point out that the uh, word, you know it's interesting to do both. Both look at. You know, the old stuff, your mother saying, don't say that, that's silly, but also ongoing stuff. So more like this, this is an ex extremely good moment to ask unseen therapists to help you clear your voice because you're in the stress right now. So I would do both, old stuff and ongoing stuff, like literally what is All going right. on right now in the webinar. Thank you. Yes, thank well, you. With that in mind, and thank you, Gabriel. I have in mind closing this out with a brief session where Unseen Therapist is going to, we're going to ask her to come in on your current stress at the moment. That would be great. Yes, thank you. All right. Anything more, Gabriel? Uh, I, was, I, want, I just want to shamelessly plug my own boot camp, if I may. <laughs> plug away. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I checked with Sherry because her bootcamp is is uh, ongoing. What I want to do is put the dates in the little chat thingy so that everybody can look at, can have a look at the dates and ask you to put it in the newsletter. Um, and I also have the Hammer workshop, which is more to do about what we just did and what we've done in our book, Gary, explaining what the underlying emotional issues are in relation to physical symptoms uh, in depth. So I have two uh, offerings, so to speak, bootcamp on chronicle issues and the Hammer uh, workshop. And well, if just, you would just, like to know just, about these. Yeah. Well, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, one way would be to just give me your email so I can put you on a little list. So I'll send it to you because otherwise I take up too much time, but I'll put the dates in the chat box and we might want to put them in your newsletter. Here. Well, you, you need, you need to send me a little blurb for my newsletter. Okay. So if you would do. Will do. Will do. Okay. All right. Thanks, Gabrielle. Let me, uh, yeah. where am I? Sherry, do you have anything more you want to, you want to talk about before we, we close with this one session with Ann? Well, I'd like to shamelessly jump in and tell everybody that Gabrielle's boot camp is amazing. I highly recommend it. Uh, if you've been in my boot camp previously or if you're currently in it, uh, really think about it because uh, some amazing information is brought forth about chronic physical issues, so. Okay. With that in mind, we're gonna close up now and, and we're gonna bring in unseen therapists. So, Anne, tell me, on a scale of zero to 10, how nervous are you? Because everybody's looking at you and they're waiting for you to f get fixed. <laughs> uh, yes, well, uh, Gabrielle actually helped me relax quite a bit. 
So maybe I'm at a three, three or four at the you're most. At, you're at a three or four. Yes. Do you feel it in your body someplace? Yes, I, I do. I actually feel it in my throat. I don't know if you can tell a difference. But yes, across my chest. Before, I could hear my heart pounding in the, in the earphones <laughs> earlier. But oh. now that's all gone. All right. Well, I, what I'm gonna, I have in mind trying to somehow or other drum this up so I can get you up to an eight or something like that. Oh. Or something. <laughs> you know. we, but we need not, we need not do that. I will, I will, I will be kind to you. How's that? Thank you. <laughs> so we've already invited unseen therapists. We need not go through that again. So if you would just close your eyes and everybody else close your eyes. Again, we're going to do this in behalf of Anne. So here's Anne, under, she's on stage, you know, she's doing something, Anne, that you're not allowed to do or haven't been allowed in, in some way, you know, since you were a child. I mean, who were you to deserve anything like this? You, after all, you are a sinner and you really, really better be good. And not speak up. Don't speak out because, boy, if you speak up, if you speak up somewhere back in there, although you're better at it now, but somewhere back in there, if you speak up, there's some kind of consequence to be paid. There's a penalty for speaking up. Oh, I don't agree with this. Oh, I don't like that. No, 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 no. We don't want to do that. No, no. Somewhere underneath all of that is you shouldn't be heard. Somewhere back there is some level of you don't deserve to be heard. If you speak up and say something, you might, you might insult somebody. You might make somebody feel bad. And that makes you a sinner. Now, of course, all of this is fiction. But it reflects some remnants of belief within you. Am I saying this well, Anne? Yes, that fits. Okay. I always like to check in. So we're going to represent this to unseen therapists as a, a throat, a set of vocal cords, a whatever mechanics are involved in having a completely pure, I deserve to be here type free voice. The impediments here would be little thingies growing within that area, growing on your vocal cords. Each one of them represents some kind of a shock. Oh, that's silly. Why did you say that? You got to look good for the neighbors and all the other things. Each one of those represents a little blemish somewhere in the voice area. We may want to get to specific events later, and we, you and I probably will. All right. But for now, we're just going to be the general stress you're feeling at the moment, being a three or a four. All right. And all these little blemishes to say, you don't deserve, you don't deserve, you don't deserve. You. What are you doing here? Why are we spending all this time on you? How silly. That's what they're saying. We're bringing an unseen therapist. She looks at this. She knows it's a fiction, but she knows it's still embedded within you. A lot of conditioning over lots of time. And you allow her now to send her gentle, cooling breeze, all this in your imagination. It comes from her 
to your voice area and spends time with each of those many, many, she can group them together. Okay, but she's gonna spend some time with each of those shock things that happened and each of the voices that says, oh, you don't deserve to be here. No, people are looking at you. Why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you taking up my time? Although they all love you. So you let you let the um, cooling breeze move in and around all these little blemishy things. And they can't survive in all that love and understanding. It just floats around there, the current stress, all the little voices you think you hear about that, the echoes of your mother that's showing up now, the echoes of the church that are showing up now, the echoes of your grandmother that are showing up now. They can't survive with all this real love. So let's do that again. Let me back up a second here. We're going to take all of those voices from the past that are giving you all this stuff in the future, in the current time. And we're going to represent them as a um, bubbling volcano. You sit above the volcano with the unseen therapist and Ching, if you want, looking down and there it all is bubbling, 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 and the love goes down and the bubbling just can't survive. And so bubble, 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 bubble. cools down and becomes a nice grassy meadow with a little lake in it you know a couple of boats floating around a piano playing joyously now let's do that again let's do that again all the blemishes on your voice your voice area changes Becomes a, becomes a bubbling, bubbling love in the bottom of a volcano. Here comes the love. Bubble, 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 bubble. This now changes to peace. The meadow, the lake, the piano. Ching. And now in your own mind, do that another time. And then another time. And as often as you want, take whatever time you want until you have completed as far as you think you can go with it. And just let me know, just tell me, open your eyes and just tell me whenever you have finished. And everyone else, just do the same, please. Okay. All right, good. Good. Are you still a three or four? Or can you tell? Let's listen to my voice and find out. Well, no, I'm talking about how you feel. Rather <laughs> oh, how I feel. Your voice too, but probably a two. Probably a two. Probably a two. All right. All right. Well, that's the kind of thing we can revisit and revisit. So we're gonna call it a day. And Big kiss for you. Gabrielle, kiss for you. Sherry, kiss for you. Everybody else, please leave me your feedback in the chat box. And I'll see you next time.